Planning Academy, a very, very good morning. I don't know if it's good afternoon to some of you, to all of you who have tuned in. And the first thing that I would like to tell you is that I, I'm not going to present this webinar. Your presenter for the day is Mr. Ashish Bahal. Mr. Bahal, as you most of you would, would be aware, is a professional architect who works for the Philips Lighting Center of Competence. And uh, he is the expert who's going to share with you, uh, you know, green lighting for existing buildings. My job is just to welcome you. Thank you very much for tuning in. And I hope you guys are all doing well. The weather has turned cool. It's, it's, it's a great time for business. It's a great time for learning. And if learning is an enabler for winning, it's time for learning together, or as we say in our, in our parlance, winning together. I uh, myself happen to come from uh, a very, very old house in uh, Kolkata, Calcutta as it was called, Kolkata as many would like to say, and my house is 150 years old. I mean, that's how it has been. I mean, it's been we have been living there for generations. And you know, with, with all the talk of uh, you know green buildings, the green movement, my child goes to school where they very strongly advocate green lighting. I had asked um, you know a local electrical con contractor in my last visit to the city that uh, do you think uh, even my house can turn green? And uh, trust me, he was not able to give me either a very definitive or a very satisfactory answer. Which probably, you know, is, is, is a life story for many people like me who do not live in brand spanking new apartments or bungalows, who live in old houses, but would nonetheless have a great, uh, you know, fancy, a fascination, a wish for turning to green lighting. And that is what Ashish is going to share and talk to you about today, how to convert existing buildings green. With that, I warmly welcome Ashish for the second time in a row in Winning Together and hand over the microphone to him for what's going to be certainly a very, very engaging session. Welcome, Ashish. Thank you so much, Mr. Roy, and welcome all. Um, so not taking too much time ahead, uh, I'll take you directly uh, to the presentation. Uh, well, uh, this presentation is about green lighting solutions for existing buildings, right? Um, so it's a simple topic, may sound like rocket science, but you know, this is the exercise is to make sure that it is, you know, it's not difficult anymore. Uh, in this presentation, I will be talking about, or rather my storyline would be, uh, you know, to begin with, of course, I'll be talking about existing buildings, you know, what are the possibilities, or as a business case, or as a personal case, whatever suit yourself. Uh, I'll be also talking briefly about the green building movement in India, you know, how it began and, uh, you know, where are we standing today. Uh, in the line of the first two topics, existing buildings and green building movement, I'll also be, you know, putting some, throwing some light on green lighting approach. You know, how do you, how does one uh, do a sustainable lighting practice or green lighting, however you want to term it. Uh, the next uh, subject would be, to the, you know, strategies, you know, how do you actually, in terms of brass tacks, uh, you know, what are the simple ways of, uh, you know, jumping from a conventional or an old technology to a, you know, more efficient or a newer or a greener technology, uh, when it comes to lighting. Uh, then I'll be obviously rushing you through a couple of case studies. Uh, uh, you know, some real life examples of how people have or how some spaces have benefited from this. Of course, this is a phenomenon itself, but I just, I've just picked up a couple of, uh, you know, projects to showcase and, you know, how and what happened then. And I'll then be, you know, ending in terms of how it can we bring about a shift in paradigm when it comes to this. You know, it's, it, you know, it may sound as I speak very simple, but, you know, for, for many consumers, for many professionals, it is also a big leap of faith, right? Uh, like Mr. Neil Armstrong on, on the moon, you know, the first step. So I guess it's the same way. But um, so um, I'll begin with, uh, you know, the existing buildings section, you know, where uh, 
you know, in, in the context of India at the moment, I will be giving certain examples of India for people outside India. Please, uh, you know, suit yourself. You may consider some, you know, depending on your culture and location, you can actually look at examples of parallel examples of that. Uh, so, uh, to begin with, Indian buildings and sustainability, you know, as, as Indians, uh, you know, we, we've been building sustainably or in, in a very climate responsive manner from ages, you know, since we've known buildings. Uh, India has a rich tradition and history in holistic strategies for buildings and construction. You know, you look back at other temples, at our small towns, at, at you know, at the little habitats of, of Rajasthan, where we, you know, sort of, inculcated the climate responsiveness in the kind of residential open spaces, community spaces in a very uh, interesting manner, in a manner which requires least uh, air conditioning, not air conditioning in the present sense, but in the, you know, erstwhile sense or lighting requirement and so on and so forth. So we were quite sustainable prior to the, you know, the current modern technology that walked in, right? So, you know, if you look at our old ways of construction, they were definitely very sustainable. But, uh, you know, present day buildings, somehow, somewhere we, we lost something in the speed of, uh, you know, development that, you know, we sort of lost our path when it came to building in a green or a sustainable manner. Um, and so we sort of disregarded the fact or, you know, the, the way the wind moves, the way the sun moves around us, the way we live our life. We are becoming more of a consumerist society. We sort of you know, uh, guzzle energy to uh, comfort ourselves through very many means, by artificial means, actually. So, um, so we sort of lost our path somewhere. So, therefore, and I also mentioned it, despite this, sustainable buildings agenda does not currently receive uh, great attention in India at the moment. Yeah. So, we, you know, all of us have a responsibility on our head to maybe learn from our past or probably correct our, you know, path at the moment uh, do some course correction to bring it back to you know less consumerist kind of and more uh, sustainable way of working because you know we also have we also owe it to the next generation uh, to leave them a legacy right and so in terms of natural resources and whatnot and I don't want to go on on this but just to say that you know we have to do some course correction at this stage right so we we were just sustainable we sort of lost our path and this is an attempt to bring it back, or the whole green building agenda is actually a sustainable buildings agenda is to help us course correct back to a sustainable way of life. Um, so what what happens? You know what is happening? If you see on the screen, uh, you know the electricity scenario in India. If you see uh, the, the generation capacity required to satiate our need is actually growing like crazy. You know, you just study. Whereas at the moment we are, you know, the actual generation capacity is not growing at that kind of speed because, you know, we uh, are relying on a lot of natural resources, coal and whatnot, right? Nuclear is yet to be explored fully, right? So there is a, the gap is only increasing, you know. If you, so India is the seventh largest country in the world, uh, leading economy and home to over a billion people living in various climatic zones. The country's economy has been growing at a fast pace ever since the progress of economic reforms started in 91. Yeah, construction plays a very important role in this economy and contributing to an average of 6.5% of GDP. Uh, so, and commercial and residential sectors continue to be a major market for construction industry. The sectors consume a lot of energy throughout the life cycle of buildings and thus become a major contributor to greenhouse gas you know, uh, emissions. So, you know, see, that's where we stand, you know, and it is only going, you know, in a, in a more grave condition. Um, you know, if you, if you also see how the commercial buildings are growing, you know, um, you know slowly we are growing faster. You know, average 5.5 5 or 6%, but if you look at the graph on the screen, the commercial flow space is actually um, increasing faster. The acceleration is on the higher side. So, even the... Spiraling urban growth, the number of buildings, energy consumption, and the resultant carbon emission is on a rise in the country. You know, so uh, as per the uh, electrical power survey of some authority that took place, the electricity demand is likely to increase by 43.7% in 2016 and 17 compared to 2011 and 12. And, and you know, further also, 
like 21, 2021 and 22 by another 37 and a half percent. You know, it's going to get crazier only with time and with the current growth path, so to speak. So, you know, with a near consistent 8 percent rise in annual energy consumption in the residential and commercial sector, building energy consumption has seen an increase from 14 percent in 1970 to, early, to nearly 33 percent in 2004-2005 until the time it was actually measured. So, uh, and but and also to give you a fact on this, electricity used in both residential and commercial is primarily for lighting, space conditioning, refrigeration, appliances, and water heating. So, you know, we are sort of, like I already mentioned, guzzling and guzzling more only, right? So, you know, we, we got to correct it somewhere. Um, also to, what happened? Sorry. I'm just going in circles. So, um, so if you see that again, as I already mentioned, the growth in Indian building sector currently uh, 659 square meter of uh, you know million square meter of commercial space is available in 2010, let's say three four years back. By 2030, uh, the, you know uh, yet to be built. You know we are going to build let's say 66 percent more. Uh, in the current building would probably be 34 percent. We are going to build more than what we have as on date by the year 2030. So it's become it's going to get humongously big. For, you know, space of building that will come up. So you know, the, we are almost ready to consume much more in future than what we are today. Yeah. And so uh, I mean, it, why is this happening? It's basically happening because of economic growth, construction growth, and human development. So the demand for energy to run appliances such as TV, air conditioning, lighting, uh, and even mobile phone charges for that matter will increase substantially as living standards rise in India. Also, the growth in commercial sector and the shift from rural to urban living will continue to take place. Yeah, This will also result in substantial increase in resultant emissions from building sector alone and need concentrate efforts to bring down the energy consumption through various measures. So, you know, we, we have a case which is ready to be worked upon and, you know, we sort of are sitting on a ticking bomb. Yeah. So if you also look at the word energy scenario, interestingly, you know, there are other nations, you know, India is actually a poor per capita consumer of, of, of energy. There is a big case for us to, to, to uh, sort of work on uh, or rather, you know, do greening of existing buildings. Of course, the new buildings will be greener. There is enough impetus being given, uh, incentive being given to the new building, but the existing building is a very, very important case to be, you know, acted upon. In fact, interestingly, there are new standards which have come in from, uh, and I'll be talking about some green building uh, standards also, rating system also. They talk about existing building already. That they have a lot of people are realizing this. Uh, so, also on your screen, if you see why existing buildings, because uh, current usage, you know, electric or other energy usage per square meter, uh, you know, for an existing building is, for example, a 250 kilowatt hour per square meter. This is just a benchmark data over 1000 commercial buildings. I'm just using an example here. Whereas a, a new building which we want to be constructed, for example, in this case, an Infosys building in Hyderabad, is consuming 70 to 80 kilowatt hour per square meter. So you see a scale of at least, if not less, three or three and a half times of energy consumption reduction, which is easily possible. So I'm not saying easily possible, but definitely possible. So which is why we are here to talk about lightning, because it is the lowest hanging fruit. It is the most easiest and accessible part of energy guzzling, uh, you know, system that any or every building will have, right? Uh, so uh, this is an easy case of intervention uh, we know what to do. I think you just have to do it. Um, continuing ahead, if I just... Um, so, just to again put it, you know, just to reinforce what I've already mentioned. Um, so, cumulative energy consumption of new and existing building, if you see with time, it is only going, going to go higher. You see, the, the new building, if you see that is the blue part, they are because of the increase in number of buildings. But in terms of existing buildings, you see as a projected, of course, by 2030, you know, the, the ratio is going to go completely different. Probably 90% of our total electricity use will be near our existing buildings. You know, we cannot, land is also a resource, we can't build anymore. So probably the new buildings will probably keep on decreasing 
then the numbers, the existing buildings will start consuming more. So, like I said, the, you know, the, the bomb is ticking. You know, we got to we got to take into cognizance what we are sitting on, right? So, um, so challenges to energy efficiency in existing building. You know, there are. You know, we we may say, okay, I already mentioned it's a good case. It's a, it's a bomb, but you know, why are people not jumping to that? So, what kind what kind of excuses do people make or to to you know owners make or facility managers make? So they say, how do we start? We don't know. I mean, you know, big case. Where do we stand? Yeah, do that. Of course, split incentives. You know, so you know what I mean. I didn't, I don't get anything out of it. People may say. So you know, it's it's like this. So there are a lot of behavioral uh, challenges, or you know, to of you know, from jump. And of course, there are some practical challenges. We will deal with it in the end of the presentation. But this is the kind of argument you may get, right? Um, and that is where we have to, uh, you know, we have to break that barrier and you know, you know make sure that you know, one little little step, and I'm sure we are you know, we are on the right path. Um, so, why? What are the pitfalls in existing lighting system for buildings of of different eras? You know, wh what is wrong with what is existing? You know, how, how what is what what is to be corrected? If I may say, so in terms of energy intensity, so no com non compliance to visual comfort. You know, the kind of uh, lighting that is existing. You know, which is old, probably. Um, you know, maybe dull or maybe too too bright for that matter, too glary. So these. This is one thing which needs to be corrected by doing appropriate lighting yeah, in a green manner, basically. So appropriateness of lighting is also very, very important uh, while this correction needs to be done, right? Uh, also, existing spaces are getting more densely populated. You see, you know, the you know the the, uh, the uh, municipal corporations are you know increasing the FAR, so more people are started staying in the same area. So um, dense, density is also increasing. Therefore, the need for lighting is also increasing. Therefore, but but the light intensity intensity was designed for probably uh, lesser population. Uh, but uh, you know this needs to be also taken care of. Yeah, would result in more of need of more light and demand supply gap projections as also as a result of this. So obviously, like I already mentioned, so you know if you are increasing. Lighting, you also need to have the past the energy to actually, uh, you know, take that gap, right? So, uh, but let me answer that question. I wonder why, why, you know, lighting should be attempted first. So, one of the easiest upgrades is lighting, LED lighting in this year that I want to talk about. Otherwise, existing buildings are messy. You know, if you go get into the air conditioning of an existing building or some other system of an of a building. There are a little, I mean, except the window air conditioner or something, but if it's a commercial building, for example, and you want to upgrade the air conditioning, it would be very difficult. But lighting, very rather simpler thing because you see most of what is, you know, what is rendering you light is actually visible or probably accessible for that matter. Of course, the cables and wires, something needs to be figured out. But uh, this is also important because it is a visual guzzler. So you actually see it happening. It, it, Conditioning system, may, you may almost forget one for one, but lighting is visible and you see that it is guzzling energy, right? It requires, I would say, little or not so little upfront investment and shows almost immediate returns. So two years, maybe that was mentioned in the last slide, two or three years maximum, I think you get your almost money, you know, started getting back. So it's an easy fix, you know, it's something which is the lowest hanging fruit, if I may say so. Right. So new light, for example, can be installed overnight or over the weekends or, you know, at a commercial space, for example, without causing disruption to occupants. And new lamps in a residential space can be easily retrofitted. So, you know, the, the lighting industry has come up with retrofit LED uh, lamps or whatever, uh, which can just be, you know, you replace the old CFL or, a, or like incandescent with an LED lamp very easily. You know, they are suited to fit into that or retrofit to that same condition. Yeah? So lighting is the easiest thing to attempt. And this is what I wanted to drive home here. Yeah. Uh, so just to sum up, what can we do with lighting? So when I has already mentioned, 70 to 12, 20% of world's energy goes towards lighting. And more than 80% of the lighting in use is based on old technologies. And which is obviously, um, you know, causing a lot of 
or consume more energy, causing more carbon dioxide emissions, uh, GHG emissions. So even if we convert a small percentage of current lighting to energy efficient lighting, I mean, you know, annually this is a number of 50 billion euro, or you know, this number can be estimated by anybody in a different way. You know, that's the kind of opportunity that we have at the moment in energy. Number one, number two, in terms of also my fellow lighting uh, companies, for that matter, who who can sort of bring in this change and also earn some revenue out of it. So, so on for once, it's a win-win because the consumers are saving because of the energy consumption, yeah, and um, uh, also uh, you know the, the lighting companies are also learning, I mean, are earning out of it basically, right? So let's go ahead and talk about a little bit about the green building movement. Yeah. Uh, so what what is important here? So, so green building movement actually started um, with uh, you know in, let's say in India in the world let's say it was started by an agency called U.S. Green Building Council, the USGBC, and when it was brought to India, um, you know by the CII. Um, it was termed as IGBC, Indian Green Building Council. Uh, well, so this Indian Green Building Council actually borrowed a lot of trades from the USGBC norms of a green building, brought it to India. Uh, you know, the, it takes references from National Building Code, ECBC, and stuff like that. Um, it's the system is based on five elements of nature. Very interesting, punch booth. Um, you know, a very Indian way of approaching. Right, and um, it's, it's a fairly big document. I don't really have to go into that at the moment, but what I can do is um, talk about uh, the IGBC new building rating system, so which is very similar to the existing building rating system. Um, you know, the you know where lighting is a specific. So I'm just referring to the lighting part of a uh, green building, uh, what it ought to be. You know, and therefore then we know where to reach out and. You know, from where, where we are, wherever we are, that is. So, for example, in the sustainable sites division, it talks about light pollution reduction. Uh, I'll be talking about these, of course. So don't worry. I'm just trying to put things in perspective. That you know, this is one I would call a religion of of uh, of green building in India called IGBC, which talks about certain criteria of uh, <coughs> green lighting. <coughs> uh, second point is um, energy efficiency. <coughs> which basically says optimize energy performance of a building by let's say 4% to 32% for existing buildings. So, you know, let's say we are at 100%, if you reduce to 96%, we get a point. So, you know, it's obviously incentivized. And if you go up to let's say 32% and beyond, you get 15 points. And that's a, that's a big number out of 100 possible. So, um, you know, that's the kind of impact lighting can have on energy efficiency. When what what is this energy performance? Again, I'll be talking about in the next few slides. Uh, then also it says supply two and a half to seven and a half percent of buildings energy used through on-site renewable energy systems. So uh, it basically says you you um, you know harness the uh, you know, and those, let's say solar energy or hydel or whatever is possible in, in or wind energy for that matter and support the building energy used to a certain percentage from two and a half to seven and a half and you get point range from two to six for example also they also talk about lighting management system where you know we just do not rely on switches only we also go to a little more you know uh, automatic or intelligent for that matter uh, if you apply that you get another point for that uh, a new point which is coming up recently, which was not there earlier, is about building material and resources, which they talk about certified green building materials or products or equipment. So lighting, or for example, LED lighting automatically qualifies for that because it is a greener building material. It doesn't have any mercury. Again, we'll be talking about it. So this is just to put things in perspective. And then, of course, they talk about daylighting also, very interesting, which I think um, may be or may not be possible in an in a existing building, but that's a very contextual thing. Since it was, you know, aligned to lighting, I thought I should put it down. And of course, it talks about innovation and design, something which has not been mentioned above, but has been attempted in uh, the project lighting uh, will also be rewarded. Yeah. Uh, if I go ahead, the other, um, if I may call it the religion is um, Griha. You know, Griha 
uh, was uh, started by Terry, the, the Energy Research Institute, along with the Ministry of New and Renewable Energy, Government of India. So it's a joint venture between um, Terry and MNRE, right? Uh, it is a made in India, made for India kind of, um, you know, a green uh, rating system, green building rating system. Yeah. While while IGBC was kind of borrowed from from the US, Greha is totally you know uh, very inbound in, in home at home kind of a rating system. Well, uh, Greha, you know, if I just generally divide how uh, how Greha and IGBC fare, IGBC is a tad bit older. It started in 2001, whereas Greha started in 2007, a little younger. Um, in terms of uh, the square footage committed to both of these, um, you know, the IGBC certainly sums up to approximately 2 billion square feet already. Whereas Greha, uh, rather younger, is, uh, you know, the kind of square footage committed to Greha is approximately, if not less, 500 million. So, um, so there is, there are enough people, or maybe there's something common between them as well. So some projects are going for both, both of the rating systems. Uh, but nevertheless, both have very interesting virtues. Uh, IDBC while is followed mostly by the industry and you know uh, commercial sector. Greha is a favorite of the uh, government and uh, you know semi-government sector, so to speak. Um, so let's let's go to the uh, Greha rating system when it comes to lighting. Well, uh, again, a very similar system or rather similar religion, you know, all, all of them lead to the same uh, God, so to speak, a green building. Um, but, you know, they just, the way of say, stating or saying it is a little different, whereas in this example, they talk about enhanced outdoor lighting system efficiency, very simple. Uh, also, in terms of optimized building design, reduce conventional energy demand by design and daylighting. Again, already mentioned in IGVC, optimize energy performance to say 40 percent than benchmark figures, or or rather at the base figure. Similar again, so we're trying to reduce the energy per square feet consumption. Yeah, use low energy materials, green building materials already mentioned. You and up to a minimum of 10 percent of internal lighting load can be into uh, renewable energy utilization. Again, there are points for these. I'm not really getting into the number of points here, but just to put things these are simple things with by doing which uh, you know actually. So for that matter, I know uh, uh, you know UP government um, did try to do this with the, for a lot of rural homes where they sort of they did uh, the lighting of the house was being sought from solar panels put above the uh, rural houses. You know, so this is a kind of initiative, of course. I don't know how much is possible and how it is possible in the urban areas, but we have to certainly look at ways of doing it in a personal manner, for example, or probably commercial buildings. Uh, for, for example, one building called Paryavaran Bhavan uh, in Delhi has its complete huge terrace covered with solar solar cells and it is actually consuming, uh, rather it is actually giving that energy produced to the grid. So it is actually a net zero or a net positive building, which means it is consuming lesser than it is producing. So very interestingly, these are not only buildings which are, uh, you know, consumers or guzzlers, they're also generators of energy. So, you know, that's the kind of trend which is going to come. Um, also, it needs to be validated, audited. I mean, this is, so Greha also said that, look, uh, you may have designed or, you know, a building or constructed a building which is green, but how is it operating? We would also like to audit and confirm that, right? So in terms of building operation and maintenance and audit and validation, they would they are very interested in the life cycle of the building as well. For example, for X number of years. Um, also, uh, innovation and design. I mean, which has already mentioned, they give you certain points for that as well, right? Um, so this is just to put in perspective how the green building movement is faring in India, and what is what do they have to say about lighting? So you know, we sort of got an understanding. Of course, there are many more points about other factors about the building, but since this is about lighting, we have to uh, bring it in focus. Um, in this section, I'll be talking about green lighting. You know, I mean, the green is not the color green, of course, but, um, you know, how do you inculcate all those uh, characters that were talked about in the last, you know, in, in let's say the IGBC and the Graha uh, rule book you know, how do you actually implement that? So this section is about that. 
Um, well, as it says on the screen, let's say turning off a photocopier at the end of the workday saves X per se percentage of energy. But uh, lighting can definitely give you, I mean, it says 75%, but it can be, I don't know, 30, 40, 50, 60, depending on where you are and what status stage that you are in, right? A similar similar example of switching off a computer screen and also save some energy. But if you, I mean, that's a very small percentage, but lighting, again, like I said, 75%. And 75% opportunity not to be missed, boss, absolutely, yeah. So what does the future hold for us? Yeah, let's just deep into what what I will say um, a green lighting approach. You know what what does it pertain? So there are about simple five ways of or five approaches which can be deployed to um, you know, arrive at a green or a greener lighting for a project. Yeah, so green product approach, efficient product approach energy saving system approach, light pollution reduction, and renewable energy approach. These are the five simple things if you do to a project, irrespective of whichever uh, green, you know, rating system you want to adhere to or you don't want to adhere to, you know, you will definitely be getting some gains out of it, yeah, in terms of energy, in terms of sustainability, in terms of a showcase or a branding for that matter, yeah. Uh, so. The green product approach talks about, I mean, just to summarize, I mean, of course, I'll be going to individual slides on these. A green product approach is primarily about choosing a luminar or a light source, which is greener from a benchmark. From So it is, is it smaller in size? Is it, you know, you consume lesser energy or is it, uh, you know, longer in, in terms of life? Um, is it, uh, I mean, is it lesser on hazardous substance for that matter? Is it lighter? Does it, you know, does it, um, in terms of packaging, is it smaller? So on and so forth. Uh, an efficient product, of course, is supposed to be, or efficient luminaire is supposed to be the one which consumes lesser and, you know, less, more light out of it. So it's like, what I, uh, you know, if I give 100 as energy, I should be getting as much as 90. I mean, I'm just saying in terms of percentages, I should be able to extract as much light out, of, out for it, right? So the, you should be able to compare between the two light sources that look, I want the more efficient one, right? So you should know the parameters of choosing the appropriate light source. The third is a system approach, energy saving system approach, which I'm talking about is that look, you may have chosen a green and an efficient luminaire, but if you do not use it appropriately, you do not distribute it in the space judiciously, uh, then also you will miss the bus. So you have to optimize the way <clears throat> the light source uh, have to be distributed in the room, right? Um, though, and also, for that matter, controlled also in the room. So, um, you know, how are we controlling source switching off and on? You know, I talked about light management system. So, it is a system approach that should look at not only one luminaire, but how it is distributed and how it is controlled. The fourth point is about light pollution. Again, I'll talk about it when the slide comes on. <clears throat> and the renewable energy approach. So, which means I've already talked about again using renewable uh, energy to run our lighting. Um, if I go to the green product approach, uh, you know, just to showcase how CII looks at uh, criteria for green product rating. Yeah, it looks at the life cycle approach, waste management. Is it you know, uh, and are we, are we able to recycle that as a waste? How is it manufactured? What are the raw materials, product performance, product design, innovation? So this is how they are certifying or, you know, looking. These are their criteria to reach out or certify a product, which is green, right? If I compare it to how Philips or for that matter, light industry looks at it. So there are these six green focal areas, very interesting, very similar and in line with what CI had to say. So energy consumption has to be lesser. Yeah, more efficiency or efficacy has to be there. In terms of packaging, it should be smaller. In terms of hazardous substance, it should have lesser, uh, you know, in terms of radiation and lesser, in so let's, for example, mercury, it should either have zero or lesser than the benchmark. Yeah, it should be lesser in terms of weight. If it, if it can have lesser weight, then it is using, definitely using lesser materials also, right? They should be possible to recycle. For example, you cannot recycle a CFL or a tube light or a halogen bulb for that matter. But you can easily recycle 
an LED because LED is plastic and silica, right? Silica goes to Mother Earth and plastic can always, plastic doesn't die, so you can easily recycle that, right? And also lifetime reliability, which means it should have a longer life, right? Um, but counting to that, if you also see on the screen, um, you know, you may have talked about the fact that it's a green product or an eco product, but the overall, if you look at the overall energy spanning of a light source, Actually, 4% of that actually goes in R&D in production and 1% goes in recycling. The lion's share of 95% goes to the how it is used, over the consumption, over its life cycle. So, um, definitely, definitely, this is a green product is an important point, but in the case is also very strong for it being an efficient product, right? So, which is what I will take up in the next slide. Uh, so, we are looking at an efficient product. So. I'm just this is just to put it in perspective that if you are using a conventional technology, you should be looking at uh, something called a high light output ratio. What is a light output ratio? So light output ratio means that uh, LOR means that the amount of light that you're getting out of the luminaire divided by the amount of light or lumen pack of the light source, which is the lamp or the tube light, for example, in this case. So how much light am I getting out of this? Overall luminaire divided by overall lumen pack of the lamp, for example. So, you know, and uh, so you get, let's say, up to 78% as it is on the screen. So, you know, imagine about 22% of light is actually wasted inside the box, right? And this is also actually one of the better ones. There are ones which actually eat up 50% also. So, you got to, in a conventional technology, you should be able to compare, you know, the light output ratio, and you will know which one. <laughs> to choose, of course, and also, you know, uh, this is also a very interesting way to catch people who are claiming anything. So you should ask for a data like, okay, tell me the LOR or light output ratio for a certain luminaire, whatever light, lumen, uh, you know, the luminaire manufacturer is trying to push you for. <clears throat> and you can easily compare between the two, right? <clears throat> Sorry. When it comes to uh, LED, the it is not called efficiency anymore, it is called efficacy. What is efficacy? It is the amount of lumens per watt consumed for LED. So you see the difference between an LED and a conventional technology is that, uh, you know, in the, in the conventional technology, we're talking about a percentage, whereas in LED, we're talking about lumen per watt. Uh, because in, in an LED, we are it's like a torch. So we are consume, or rather using everything that is coming out. So efficiency is almost 100%. But how do we compare between two LEDs in that case? So you can compare it by using this or using this term called lumen per watt, which is the efficacy. Interestingly, which also differs for LED type, color temperature, and color rendering index. Which means if it is a uh, if it is a warmer one, the warmer one will seem like lesser efficient or lesser less efficacy than the cooler light for that matter. So we you know or for that matter, CRI stands for color rendering index, which means if it is a high color rendering index, it means it is showing true colors, then the efficacy will be a little lesser because most of the energy is being used to produce better light for that matter. But nevertheless, this is just to be put into a perspective, but you can compare between LEDs by this term called efficacy, which is lumen per watt. And also, this is to be noted that the lumen per watt of a bare LED uh, is not equal to lumen per watt of the luminaire, right? Because of the thermal losses, optical losses, and driver losses. See, for like any other technology, this there is also production of some thermal, some heat, something which is lost in the diffuser, and something which is eaten by, by the driver, which is a fact and which is to be declared, of course. So if a luminar manufacturer is trying to push you by saying, okay, we'll give you 120 lumen per watt, please ask them, okay, is it the bare LED you're referring to or the system or a luminar uh, level you're talking about? Because they will definitely be some losses on the way. So maybe that 120 comes down to 80 when you ask these, you know, the losses will take away, let's say 40 or lumen per watt um, because of that. So you have to also compare it from system to system. So what is key to understand here? Color temperature, cool white LEDs are more efficient than warm. And when comparing lumen per watt, make sure that the total system output and system power is taken into account. Even in terms of lumen pack also, you know, when, when these manufacturers mention a lumen pack, do ask whether this is at the system level or whether it is at the LED level or a chip level. Because the chip level will be more, but because eventually what comes out of 
the box so to speak will be a bit lesser so you have to know what loss what was lost in the way and hence should be able to compare from system to system right okay so i think that should help you with how to choose an efficient product uh, let's go to a system approach now in system approach the measure of uh, you know comparing a system to another system is lpd um, which is a light power density which means amount of uh, or rather the wattage which is consumed per square feet but also one one catch here is that you should be comparing to lpds at similar lux levels you know you may say okay one is at 300 lux level and another is 600 lux level definitely the uh, light part density for 600 lux level will be more than 300 lux 300 lux level so you know other things being equal then you can compare to lpds so please be sh- make sure you make a justified or you know judicious uh you know approach in terms of choosing the lighting system how the light or luminaires are distributed in a space you can choose a system which is more optimized with a comparable or other you know at a comparable lux level a lesser lpd is what is preferred right as you can see on the screen lpd uh, has been defined by ashre and there are many uh, ways of approaching it building area approach and space by city space, space approach which is possible uh you know you you can sort of choose whichever route for your project right um when it go, goes to the next point which is the in in terms of system approach also we can also look at lighting controls you know so like i said already that you know you cannot always rely on humans and switches to <clears throat> make sure that they are switched off when the person leaves the room or you know is in the room or you don't need as much light that as much light is coming from the windows or daylighting is enough daylighting is there then you should apply lighting control which is a very simple thing which means you put motion detectors or daylight sensors right which can be tied up with the luminaires and in the, the luminaires can then be dimmed or switched off depending on whether there is a person present in the room or there is enough daylight in the room or probably there is an and or situation where there is daylight as well as presence or no presence so these are intelligent sensors which can actually control these luminaires see the best luminaire or best most energy efficient luminaire is the one which is switched off there is no power there is not burning right there is the best luminaire because there is no loss of light there is no loss of power right so but and which can be achieved only when when it is required to do it when there is no one in the room or no one in the space right and that is can only happen or the best thing that can happen is an automatic or an intelligent one where they get switched on and off depending on presence because the person may or may not forget switching off the light when leaving the room but an automatic sensor would definitely digitally do that once you leave and that can already that can be set you know that you can that will happen only 5 minutes or you know the lapse can be decided very easily this is not rocket science anymore yeah another one on a system approach is using an energy management system where we are going one level up where there's a lot of intelligence built in with these luminaires these sensors they all are connected to a central computer which seeks data and asks them to do things which means if they are switching on and off um, so this central computer knows and notices and you know creates data out of it which can then become a data point for the facility manager to take new decisions you know that okay these guys this space is consuming more uh, you know for that matter these lamps need to be replaced so on and so forth so uh, a management system for a large project makes very much sense it is easier to manage you don't have to go around physically to check the health of the light sources uh, this management system will automatically gives you give you uh, you know alerts in terms of failures or something wrong or even in advance that okay this set of luminaires have lived their life so please change them so this is a kind of uh, information this this uh, the system can give you so we're looking at systems and controlling it as a system here the light sources uh, well um the fourth point is lighting pollution reduction now i don't know whether you can see anything on the screen we cannot because uh, there's a lot of light pollution there's light coming to areas where we don't need actually you don't really don't need uh uh you know light coming out of the building to to the dark uh, you know i mean basically you don't need it in the sky right so it is actually affecting a lot of uh, night life uh, of a bird and the migratory birds often lose their path 
uh, when there's a lot of light which is coming from the building, it is actually wasted because it is not going to areas where it is meant for, and it is actually polluting spaces where it's not meant to be. You know, we are actually pushing the animal life by the noise pollution <coughs> and the, uh, I mean, by sound pollution and by the light pollution. And that's why we often hear of these tigers prowling the cities in the night. So they are very disturbed. Even, you know, these migratory birds die if they, you know, lose their path for that matter. So we don't want to disturb, or, you know, uh, the balance of nature by at least by lighting to begin with. So we, so what is, what is the key to understand here? So we should do uniform illumination, zero trespass at project boundaries, no uplighting of trees or buildings for that matter. And even if you do, do very minimally. And maintain facade lighting on the building face only. Let's not spill light. And it should not go to areas where it is not meant to be. So it's not about any technology. It's a choice that we have to make. Yeah, it is just a sane approach, you know, you know, to to lighting that we should do. And the last point, like I already mentioned, was a renewable energy approach. Well, if it is if it's possible for you to apply or you you know uh, uh, deploy. Uh, let's say solar cells on the terrace of your house or whatever, or a building for that matter. Great if you can do that and also do conversion from DC to AC to supply to the lighting system of your building. Great. Otherwise, the lowest hanging fruit is using, for example, a solar street light system. You know, in in, a, in the building, in the campus or whatever space you want to change the lighting for. Yeah, it's a direct and the easiest way to do that. Yeah. So these are the couple of approaches that I mention you know the five things that i mentioned about choosing a green product uh, an efficient product an energy saving system uh doing the you know light pollution reduction and also the renewable energy approach if you apply these four five approaches i think with any lighting system any uh, green rating system under the sun we can definitely you know align ourselves likewise right and also you know benefit from the reduction in energy consumption as well <clears throat> Again, to sum up, why LEDs? So LEDs have many advantages. I mean, this is probably I am just repeating myself here, but I think it's important for people who do not know. Uh, so, from conventional to LED, what kind of uh, advantages? Let's say long-lasting and low maintenance. Of course, energy efficient. Possible to digitally color control them or control them as well. Yeah, small in size, directed light because it works like a torch. So, you know, it is not wasting an energy. Wherever you need to throw light, it will just turn the direction it is there. So, not much of light is being wasted. So, efficiency is increased uh, and even efficacy is increased for that matter. Robust <clears throat> because it is smaller in size and, you know, um, so all the other technologies you see, fluorescent, halogen, incandescent, were all gas-based, whereas LED is actually solid state technology. Yeah, so conduction <clears throat> is faster than radiation, right? So, it's much more efficient too. Uh, turns on instantly, no infrared and ultraviolet radiation, so very safe for human beings, which is not the case with fluorescent and incandescent. Beam of light is cool, so it is not like if you if you see a CFL for that matter, you cannot touch a CFL while it is burning, which you can definitely do with an LED. It is not at all hot, so cool beam of light. Low voltage, so very much safe for the consumers, and no mercury, so it is not polluting, no, no hazardous substance in so it's very much, and then the, the green focal area that I had mentioned earlier, it very much scores over all of them. So it's a definitely choosing a LED product is a, it's already a green product. And of course, it gives you advantages in terms of efficiency and also if used judiciously, which means you optimize the way it is distributed in the space, which can be verified, uh, you know, by, by people like us, designers of lighting systems. Um, it is possible to jump from a conventional or a old technology or from existing building to a greener building, greener existing building for that matter, right? Uh, so just to uh, sum up a couple of upgrade strategies, uh, you know, how do you strategize, how do you upgrade from conventional systems? And these are simple steps. I'm not going into brass tacks of it, but just to you know give you a peekaboo on what's possible, right? And you know, of course, for a detailed project thing, we can definitely talk in person and case to case basis. This is a generic update in terms of how can we upgrade. So, what is the possibility? The level number one possibility is very simple: the replacement of inefficient lamp 
existing lamps with efficient ones, for example. So, simpler, you know, in residential, of course, you just replace it, for example, from a CA filter and LED, simple, LED bulb. LED light source, all of them are available as in there, but we call them as a retrofit one for that matter. And also, as you see on the screen, if you if you show, see that, that from you know, if you're talking about the first three steps, which was the earlier technology electromagnetic uh, with fluorescent lamp, uh, you know, if you change from electromagnetic by last to a new technology lamp, I mean, from a old standard fluorescent to a new technology lamp, you get a mere 10%. But if you change it from electronic gear, from electromagnetic to electronic gear, still 45 percent. But if you change from electronic gear, I mean the old technology to new technology, you get a 25 percent more. 25 percent is a big jump, at least when it comes to lamps only, right? Uh, what is the strategy number two or possibility number two? Number two says replacement of inefficient lamps and luminaires with efficient ones. Then basic minimum controls. We're talking about many minimal controls that look. Just talk about, uh, so when you change from conventional lamps to a luminar, let's say a downlighter, you cannot change a lamp and a downlighter. Uh, uh, you can just change it, change the luminar itself and become an integrated luminar, which is much more efficient, fresher, newer, and which will fit in the same size. So retrofitting it in the same space in the ceiling for that matter, right? Uh, and also using simple controls like sensors, you know, you're not looking at network controls, Looking okay, at simple control, the presence based, and also, for example, daylight linked uh, linkage. Even if you do that, 40% more reduction. You know, so you know you can actually jump down in terms of uh, consumption by, like already mentioned, 75%. You know, that's the kind of possibilities we have as on day. Yeah. What is the level number three? Well, replacement of existing system with state of art lighting system and integrated control system. So. In the third step, what we are stating is that, okay, let's scrap the, you know, we don't say point to point replacement. We don't do only minimal thing. We just scrap the entire lighting system and make a completely new system, design it appropriately to suit the need, maybe reduce the number of points, and also integrate a control system which is much more intelligent and efficient and tech savvy. You know, you can just press a button on the wall and not a switch anymore or probably from a remote and things start happening, right? Uh, so a lot more intelligence and control can be brought in also, bringing an energy reduction apart from the show and stuff. Yeah, so these are the simple three strategies, of course, I sum it up here. So what is the light mantra for a, for a retrofit project? So point to point replacement, easy and quick, what saving, but not much of, I mean, so very simple, 3.5% in terms of energy saving. Return on investment definitely is there. And in, if it comes to an office space, for example, you know, you can say, okay, we've converted. So you can talk about it to employees, the employee gets engaged, right? Uh, the next point was redesign lighting. So rigorous, clear energy saving. Again, similar thing, you're replacing not only lamps, but other luminaire in this case. Then we're talking about controls when we talk about from watts to energy. And if you want to go for the next level, we can look at intelligent networking, like I already said. So <clears throat> three or four ways of simple working depending on the kind of capital investment that one wants to do and the kind of jump or wherever you are. Let's say you are at a very guzzling level and you can see value in terms of, let's say, you know, probably 75% jump or rather reduction in terms of energy. Then I think it's worthwhile, you know, investing into something like that because it is giving you returns year on year, basically. Right? Um, let's go to the Next slide, it talks about systems, you know, how do you, simple steps of how can you do that? So number one step is establish the existing visual comfort levels maintained in the building. So what is, you know, study, so it's supposed to be audited appropriately. So we, we should know where we are in terms of light levels and light quality. Yeah. Also step two, compare it with recommended levels by different codes. For example, I mean, we just shown a couple of them. C6 forces, National Building Code, SP4132. So we say, okay, what is the light level that we're getting as on day? Uh, what is it, or light levels or light conditions? Compare it with what the code says, whether it is more or less, what is required. Number three is to establish the baseline energy level of the lighting system. Calculate the existing energy level. Then project modified figures for the lighting system refurbished 
with the existing lighting fixtures only to meet the visual comfort, you know, and show the increase in lighting system energy to comply with code requirements. So we have to just project it in a manner that look, if you have to comply to the code, what is the you know revision in energy that will happen? Uh, step four, establish a total cost of ownership. But what we are saying is that if we depending on the kind of intervention that you want to take up, we can actually look at total cost of ownership. What is meant by that is that look, if we are let's say consuming with the same uh, luminaire, we are using the same luminaire, let's say over five years period for that matter. So what kind of operating expenditure will you have in terms of the same wattage if you continue? Uh, what is the kind of money that you would spend a total cost of ownership of using the same luminaire for five years? Versus, if you were to jump to an LED or a control system that was you know explained earlier, so what is the kind of capex of capital expenditure plus operating expenditure for the same amount of time, and and more more often than so, the capital expenditure or the operating expenditure of the current lighting system will definitely be more than the capex plus opex of an LED system. Yeah, so it is an easy case, and and this can be showcased with a live example, of course. I don't have one at the moment, but that will depend from case to case. But you can definitely do from one to one depending on your case, right? And select the intervention level based on the budgetary constraint. Of course, you have a pocket, which can also be worked upon, which I will definitely be talking about next. And develop the plan for intervention and how do you want to do that? So, and the first and most important one, which everybody will say that okay, we don't have the money, right? So this is an example of how lighting is being. You know, lighting is seen as not only lighting, but as a service from now on. You know, this is what, for example, and this is just an example how Philips is doing it. So, Philips lighting services are available separately. All of them can be combined into tailor-made turnkey package also that delivers completely coordinated solution design, project execution, and life cycle support from start to finish. So, for example, Philips lighting capital can help you finance the project. You know, say, okay, I don't have the money, uh, but uh, but I want to do it. So what is the amount of money that I need to do that? So Philips can, with a little upfront payment from your side, let's say 10%, this 90% can be furnished by Philips, right, for the project cost, and it can be recovered over a period of time, let's say on a little rate of interest, or else can also be, you know, uh, earned out of the difference in terms of the energy saving. You know, so let's say you're making, let's say you're saving 60% from earlier. So that 60% will go probably in, this, in the kitty of Philips for like the X number of months, depending on the numbers. And after that number of months, when Philips has recovered that cost, in the, you know you can actually start enjoying the benefits of reduced energy consumption. So you don't you don't have to really you know invest upfront, but you started getting benefit. Let's say three or I don't know, I'm just saying it two or three or two or three years later for example, depending on the amount of amount and the divide percentage. Right, so that's the kind of support. So what is Philips doing here, for example, is working like an ESCO, an energy services company, right? And these are the kind of offerings uh, now a lot of companies, including Philips, are giving, right? Then we are also talking about pro uh, lighting project services. So maybe you cannot do it on your own. So we you need train train electricians and so on and so forth. So Philips. For example, and many other companies like that can give you project services. Okay, we'll do the project management. We'll install it for you. We will also integrate and program it for you. Also, I missed that. Prior to that, obviously, advisory services are required. We need to do an audit of your play, of your space in the steps that were mentioned already in terms of the lighting levels, the energy consumption, you know, the state of uh, the conditions of lighting and the wiring for that matter. So it needs to be properly uh, you know studied and benchmarked for proper interventions. And it should not happen that six months hence things start to fail because of some short circuit or something like that, or for that matter, any spike or any other problem that can happen. So that needs to be studied in advance and taken care of. And this is an advisory service, which Philips and many other companies again do that. And of course, for a life cycle, let's say for three or two or three or more years, whatever it is, Philips can also get into, or maybe six or seven years or 10 years, whatever it is, again, suit, suit yourself can be that we can give you a life cycle service so support, maintenance, and performance also. So, and very, very important here is that, you know, the in a retrofit project or an end-to-end solution, you should always be asking for performance-based contracting. You know, whoever comes to you, maybe it's Phillips or anybody else, what is important here is 
<coughs> it should be based on performance. It should not be like that the lux levels are dropping. Maybe you are using less energy, but you know we are feeling darker and not so healthy. So I think that is a no uh, compromise situation where you should always say that okay, it is always based on performance. You know, if it doesn't perform, it doesn't work for us. Yeah. So um, <coughs> if I go to the next. Um, uh, chapter, so to speak, is about case studies. Just to showcase a couple of uh, projects where people have benefited out of a lot of institutions or companies or whoever has done it has benefited out of it uh, and how have they done it. Just a few examples on that. To begin with, uh, you know, a, a city like Agra and the State Bank of India branch out there. So, you know, I, I don't know if you know, but State Bank of India the largest commercial bank with over 16,000 branches across the country. For renovating its over 150-year-old branch at Agra, the bank wanted to use modern and efficient lighting. Well, Philips, again, I mean, this is primarily Philips example. There can be many more examples of other companies also. So we collaborated with SBI team and suggested, let's say, I mean, in this case, a 2 by 2 solution, which is a 40 water, which changed for example, a 75 watt, 240 watt, and these two, two by two, they have a point to point replacement in this case, and a down lighter, which were again a jump from 42 watt down lighters to a 15 watt down lighter for that matter. Again, two and a half times reduction in terms of energy consumption. Yeah, so this was an end to end process. Again, we did, we did, just did not furnish the light sources, we also installed it for them. Yeah, and we're also maintaining it for them for that matter. Yeah. So, of course, they did not accept it. Again, initial barriers, um, uh, teetering problems, but then, you know, we did some lot of explaining and testing and we showcased to them that the light level will not be lost. Yeah. Uh, and as you can see, it's come out to be pretty nice, you know, I mean, the way looking pretty modern um, and inviting and also doing some brand resurrection from State for State Bank of India as well. So, the space has come out nicer. And lighting is what is, I think, primarily behind this. Yeah. So again, this is just to showcase what's possible and how an archaic bank like State Bank of India, which is one of the most old bank of India, is also taking the, you know, taking the pill. You know, they're actually doing going ahead. They have, they have actually seen that it better their bottom line. Another very, I mean, these are random examples across the country. Uh, so, for example, in Anand, Gujarat, this this uh, Alcon engineering company. Upgraded from uh, you know conventional luminous LED, not only in their uh, office but also in their factory as well. So it is a leading manufacturer for material handling equipment in India. For their integrated plant come office complex in Anand, uh, again they partnered with us and uh, we sort of again gave them uh, uh, you know similar example than what SBI did. Uh, about 40, 42 watt of uh, 2 by 2, which replaced again 75 watt of a, uh, of a conventional technology with, with, with luminaires, which are probably 50,000 burning hours guaranteed. Uh, with, and also down lighters, which again 15 watt, probably 10 watt. So, you know, you can see the amount of lux levels and the kind of liveliness the space has, has been come up with. And also, in comes to uh, the workspace. And the high lights and also been, you can see the factory space is also pretty well lit. You know, if you compare it to uh, normal working spaces in factories, it would not have been so bright and nice. You know, and, uh, you know for that matter, it really enhances the safety of the workers and also engages them as employees to the company because they are looking, they are actually benefiting their health and well-being. Yeah. Um, another another example of this. Supermarket in, in, in Hyderabad. Uh, well, Ratnadeep's supermarket is well known uh, in South India. For people in South India, they would know that. Yeah, again, uh, they jumped from, uh, you know, they have, if you can see on the screen, a lot of down lighters are what they are putting. You know, if you, they have actually uh, saved up to one third of their uh, original demand by converting uh, to these uh, 10 watt and 15 watt down light as against. Uh, 45 watts and 30 watt down lights. So, you know, huge difference in consumption and also the space is pretty bright for a longer period of time. So, you know, many, many advantages uh, of doing that. And they're 
they've been vociferous about their satisfaction if you can just go up to a youtube uh, thing and just you know you know find out this uh, ratnadeep supermarket you will see people talking about it and for that matter even sbi also all these case studies i'm talking about are up there in public and on youtube for you to see and learn, probably take some examples from that you know how they actually uh, brought about this change uh, if you see on the screen also i mean there's a lot of humongous amount of downlight there that to uh, change yeah so not only this where all uh, you know where this color rendering index is not too important to a space like this um uh, you know let's say this uh, man mandir it's a uh, apparel store in chennai where you have to see colors and so ladies would acknowledge that you know you have to see take the uh, in the fabric outside in the sun to see its true color uh, in a space like this uh, you know lighting with led is actually change the game you know the way how the store looks it looks beautiful and you know very enticing and, and of course the merchandise uh, definitely takes the center stage because lighting is doing that here yeah so man mandir is a leading fabric and garment retail store in chennai uh, again they went and they actually easily uh, got a saving of more than 50% by uh, converting to uh, led in this case Yeah, you can you can actually have a look at how the space looks and how people are enjoying even new lighting. So you may or may not notice, but you know lighting is definitely and it's visible. But in terms of screening and in terms of branding, it definitely gives you a big fillip. Yeah. Um, another another interesting example is the uh, Moria. It's again I'm looking at a variety of space. You see from an office to retail store to a high end apparel store to a hotel for that matter so this is a uh, itc i don't have to give you an background of that so so these these people are also an itc is known for its green initiatives uh, very vocal about what they do so you know they they also change from the conventional uh, light sources to led bulbs for that matter because they cannot change the luminaires or lights uh, in this lamp for that matter what you see on the screen but just changing from uh, a halogen or a cfl to led uh, bulbs actually give them an easily 25 to 30% saving straight forward you know without any great uh, intervention just by changing lamps yeah so uh, and they also you know again brand ambassadors from going green so they so being the the company that they are they did not shy away from doing that you know it's a fairly large installation for that matter um another example another office in 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 chennai you know akshay akshay is a real estate developer and the corporate quarter in chennai again you know they went i mean these examples are actually going multifold now i'm just picking up randomly um you know again they also benefited in a very similar manner right um also spencer's uh, stores you know simple uh, store in vizag uh huge uh, chain of stores spencer they have also acknowledged because it affects the bottom line very directly yeah so they have more than 135 stores in and 33 uh, hypermarkets across india so they were also facing facing issues uh, with uh, in terms of consumption and you know their bottom line and they had to they, it was a top pure business case for them to you know jump from let's say conventional or the cfl or tube light technology So in this case, uh, LED button. If you see the linear uh, button uh, of LED, which is on the screen, you know, and in terms of color rendering and the feel of the space, it is very, 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 very interesting um, to you know see what what you know, what change there in terms of space also, yeah, uh, and more attractive. You know, the, the brand itself gets a big fillip from there. Um, so here, I would like to end. this case study section i just like to sum up what i uh, had to say in this case yeah so what is it you know we just trying to shift some paradigms here uh, i may have tried to prove to you that it makes sense to jump from or do an upgrade so what what kind of um, benefits it bring to uh, a lot of stakeholders you know um, if you so let's say do a facility it is basically low maintenance and low inventory you don't really have to invest 
and keep inventory of light sources and also maintenance cycles are slower. So the disruption of work is also lesser. Uh, for employees, in this case, and let's say an office space, more than a smart workspace. Um, again, for finance, people who are investing in it or you know trying to uh, work on the bottom lines of an organization or a, a commercial space, low operating expenditure and fast, you know, uh, return on investment. And also for the management, it is a case showcase of sustainability. And this is something they want to talk about, that look, you know, we are a green company and so on. So there, there's a lot for everybody if, you, if one makes that change. Uh, just to sum up on the tangible and intangible benefits, so uh, reduction in carbon footprint, reduction in also electrical and HVAC load also. So heat, ventilation, air conditioning load also, because light sources also add uh, some heat to the system which has to be taken care of by the HVAC system. LED, because it doesn't, uh, give away heat, at least in the air conditioned spaces, um, you know, there is already lesser load on the HVAC, right? Um, also, increased efficiency of electrical systems, there are lesser, lesser current flows because of lesser load, so the longevity of the electrical system is also better. Uh, maintenance I already talked about, improved ambience and lighting levels, happier and productive employees, you know, you, there is already a correlation which has been proven that you know better lighting uh, definitely increases the productivity and attention of employees. Um, sprucing of, of a green branding for the for the organization which is doing that upgrade. Yeah, engagement of employer employees with the green, green employer brand. So one talk, can talk about it. You know the people everybody can talk about how um, you know my company for example you know becomes a green company by changing the lighting. Yeah, and awareness of technology, definitely, and showcase of leadership as a green operation. So, you know, these are not everybody, everything can be calculated in numbers, but these are the clear tangible and intangible benefits apart from the return on investment and the kind of saving that you would make on uh, in terms of your investments. Yeah, but then there are challenges, you know, it's not an easy path. Uh, willingness and limited knowledge of owners. Uh, Finance, investment capital, I already gave you, uh, you know, a solution for that, but, you know, it's for people who do not know this, pos of, of, you know, option available or possibility, it definitely is a big barrier. Yeah, incompetent, incomplete and inconsistent data of the facility as existing, you know, people do not know, okay, what happened, how are these wirings, you know, how, where is it ending, terminating. So, these, these are a few challenges which needs to be you know, <clears throat> taken into stride and solved, of course, but this is just to showcase that, look, you know, be careful, be wary of these things, right? Availability of trained electricians in, you know, of people who apply, so that can also be solved by, you know, deploying a professional company to be able to help you do that. <clears throat> Limited workplace disruption is, you, know, you cannot just disrupt people working on a table, look, look, you know, we have to change the light source or we have to maintain it for that matter. So that has to be also taken care of. Ceiling adaptations, electrical rework, very, very important. And also has to be you know, accepted and it should not be taken for granted. So they, you may have to do something like these as well. And of course, existing products have to be um, disposed appropriately in the right manner. Uh, should not be just dumped and wasted uh, because you know, at the end of the day, mercury filters through our, through our soil and eventually we end up drinking it one way or the other. So you know, it is affecting our health in general. Yeah. Uh, just to summarize, um, you know, a fact for existing building and its lighting. So a building doesn't have to be new to be efficient. You know? It has, it doesn't, you know, even existing building can be converted to be efficient. Yeah. Today's leading building owners and re are retrofitting buildings, converting existing buildings into models of sustainability. There are enough examples, and I've shown you a couple of them, and there are many more across the web, across the world. Yeah, um, who are taking this step. Yeah, while most building owners still pursue single technology improvements, market leaders bundle together energy saving technologies to get deeper savings and more comprehensive approach. So one simple approach, for example, is like I talked about just LED, you can actually bundle it up with controls and, uh, you know, definitely take, you know, extract most of it also. So up to 75% easily possible. You know, imagine your bill dropping by X percentage because of this small step that you've taken. And energy, so I already uh, talked about performance-based contracting. 
Even energy performance contracting, I already talked about, is one business model that enables building owners to implement old building relevant retrofits and significantly lower energy consumption and operating costs. Essentially, the upgrades are paid for through energy saving over time. So it is, uh, you know, sort of, I mean, it's an easy case. I'm not saying that, you know, jump to it, but just take, you know, one for yourself, you know, take up in your own case. If you want us to help you in auditing, creating a case out of it, we are more than happy to do that, or maybe even deploy anyone else. I mean, this is an, an open invitation. But the uh, benefits are on your face. You know, it's just up to you that uh, how do you want to take it up. Yeah, I think with this, I rest my case. Um, thank you so much. Uh,